Hi, everybody. Welcome to beautiful Miller Sylvania Park here in Thurston County. Thank you so much for joining us today for our live event. Uh, we're so excited to have you here and talk about some of my favorite things, camping, wildlife, and keeping a clean camp, and also fire safety. So a couple of just housekeeping items before we get started. If you have questions, put them in the Q&A function. The chat is closed at this time, so if you have questions, type them in there. If you're watching live on Facebook, please just leave a comment and they'll route questions to us here at the park. Closed captions are also on. If you'd like to turn those off, you can just hit the little CC in the corner of your screen and turn those off. And then we'll also mention a bunch of links today and we'll put those on our Medium page, which you'll be able to find at wdfw.wa.gov. So as I mentioned earlier, some of the things we're gonna talk about today are keeping a clean camp, responsible wildlife viewing, and campfire safety. So without further ado, we'll get started and I'll have Alyssa come on out and get us rolling. Hi there, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to have all of you. Um, my name is Alyssa Adams. I work for Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission. I'm a parks interpretive specialist here with the agency. My primary duty station is the Upper College Recreation Area, um, which is the Mount St. Helens Visitor Center, Lewis and Clark State Park, Ikenswa, and Sequest State Park. So I'm really excited to be here at Miller Sylvania this evening, enjoying this beautiful campground. Um, before I really get started, I want to do a quick land acknowledgement. It's really important to recognize the tribes that call this place home. Where I work down here in Southwest Washington, this is the land of the Cowlitz, the Upper Chinook, and the Klickitat tribes. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. So as you recognize already, looking around me this evening, our park system has an abundant variety of habitats available. And with such great habitat, we have incredible biodiversity. That's both the number of species and the variety of species found in our parks. With over 100 state parks, there's a lot of animals that call this place home. Now, the first program this evening that I'll dive right into momentarily is talking about parks that offer spectacular wildlife watching opportunities. Now, before I really get into it, I wanna talk briefly about how that happens and how you can best have your chances to see those animals. It really depends on the seasonality, our weather, and things like migration. Let's get right into it. Our state not only has fabulous habitat, but it also has something called the rain shadow effect. I bet you know what that is. That means that our state's basically divided in two. We've got the Cascade Mountain Range going right through the middle. Over here on this side, it's pretty wet and moist and rainy, good old Washington. And over on the eastern side in the central part of our state, we've got a lot of arid climate. So let's talk about the birds. We have so many birds here in Washington state. In fact, a lot of our birds and uh, wildlife watching opportunities are part of the Great Washington State Birding Trail. There's many brochures available through Audubon Go ahead and take a look at these next time you're able to online or asking for them to mail you a copy. But the wildlife, that's what people get excited about. These maps, if I show you this, are available at all of our Washington State Park. So if you want to grab one for your next adventure, I encourage you to do so. Let's take a look here at some of the coolest sightings that you can find. We on camera here? Excellent. Let's talk about the coast range right along here. If you're at Deception Pass State Park, Kama Beach or Camino Island out in the Woodby Island area, or all the way down here at Cage Disappointment State Park, well, whale migrations are a must. We've got both the gray whales and the orcas passing through. So if you are into whale watching, that is the place to be. Um, as we pass up here to Limestone Point State Park up in the Salish Sea and uh, the Puget Sound area, you're gonna find our resident South Orca pods, which is pretty exciting. The day pod frequently goes right through the Limecone Point State Park area. So again, if you hop on a ferry, head up to that area there, you're bound to see some orcas or porpoises in that watershed. Coming down here to Kids Disappointment State Park, there's a lot of great things to say and see. Besides the gray whales, they have other whales that travel all the way up the Columbia River, 10 miles in, humpback whales, believe it or not. They've been seen chasing schools of fish. That's quite a treat. In fact, it's visible on the bridge to Astoria. Uh, it's obviously a seasonal migration based on when those fish are passing through, but that's a treat for people and doesn't happen very often. Cape Disappointment has more than that to offer though. Are you familiar with birding? The sooty shearwater is a species that's recorded as having the longest migration recorded by scientists. 
that is visible out here on the coastline. You're going to need binoculars to see that, though, because they're basically a gray mass of smoke hovering right along the waterline. But if you're a birder, you know what to look for. And of course, one more thing to mention about that park, if you're familiar with that area and you've been paying attention to the news articles, there was a wolverine spotted in Pacific County. And my goodness, that's one of the most exciting wildlife uh, spottings that we probably had in recent history, totally out of its normal habitat range, but so exciting to see. Let's take a look at some other areas real quick. Rockport State Park, visit them in the winter time to see the bald eagle migration out on the Skagit River. That's another treat. Um, way over here, some links by Falls State Park. That's the Cooley Corridor, Sagebrush Shrub Step. That place out there, well, they've got little things like yellow-bellied marmots and porcupines. That's pretty cool. Down here at Kinko Petrified Forest, big horned sheep. Now, right now, they're pretty hard to see. The moms are off having their babies and privacy. But come summertime, you'll see 30 to 50 of them in packs out there in those herds taking care of their babes that just came out. And down here at Corn Simcoe, they've got pretty unique habitat. They've got oak trees out there. You're going to find things like black bears, ground squirrels, Lewis's woodpecker, again, for the birders. As you can see, there's incredible diversity in our state. Let's not forget about this area way up here in the corner. The Crawford Caves and Gardner Cave area. There are moose right along the Canada and Idaho border. There's even been moose spotted way down here in the Blue Mountains. So as you can see, our parks have incredible habitat for the animals that live here. And we need your help to keep these places protected. All right, let's pass it off to our next presenter, Laurel. Thanks so much. Put the mask on. On with the show. Thank you. Um, I'm Laurel Haas. I'm the Reservation System Manager at Washington State Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, good evening and welcome. And um, I wanted to mention in terms of wildlife, one of my favorite things is seeing little baby sandpipers running along on the shores uh, of the ocean at parks like Ocean City and Grayland Beach. So I'm going to show you how to make a reservation on the website. So, um, you know, one of the best ways to make sure that you, you get a great camping spot is, is to make a reservation in advance. So I will show you how to do that um, on our reservation system website. So I am going to share um, our parks page here. Everybody see that? Can everybody see the uh, Washington State Parks page? Yes, we can see it. Great. Okay. So um, this is at parks.state.wa.us. And uh, this is our State Parks homepage. And to make a reservation, I'm just going to click on this, you know, easy to read box here that says reservations. And uh, when I click on that, you'll see um, a our reservations front page and we have a nice big button on there that says book now. So that's that's the button I'm going to click on. We have some other information on this page as well. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about roof accommodations like cabins, group facilities or the houses to rent at Fort Warden. I'm just going to click on book now here, which is going to take us to our um, reservation website. And then I'm actually going to switch over to um, our test website here. So let me share this. Okay. So can you see the uh, reservation website? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so here we are. So um, I wanted to give you some tips on finding availability on the website. Uh, so uh, you can make reservations up to nine months in advance of your arrival date. And if you're really set on a, a special site or um, a popular park, I recommend you know, that, that you make plans in advance as soon as possible. We do have many customers that do that. They're on this site um, nine months ahead of their arrival date at seven in the morning booking those sites. Uh, however, um, if you don't, if you're, you're not able to make plans that early, 
Um, most of our reservation activity takes place either then or about a month ahead of, of uh, your arrival date. So you have plenty of time to find availability in between then, uh, but the sooner the better. Um, the other thing is um, we always have much more availability during the weekdays um, and um, out of the season as well. Uh, so, uh, be, you know, before uh, May, after September, uh, we have more availability. And um, I'm also going to show you some tips on the website to find availability as well. And uh, one more thing would be, um, I recommend driving through the campground before uh, you make a reservation. So if you happen to be in an area of a park you'd like to stay at, definitely take a nice slow drive through the, the campground and, and take a look at the sites and, and you can jot down some notes on campsites you might like to reserve. Okay, so um, on the website, the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sign in and uh, when you book, uh, reservations on this site, you're going to create an account, which is a good thing because you'll be able to associate all your reservations with this account um, so you can go back and look at them later. Uh, you'll also be able to store information in a profile uh, that uh, in terms of your search preferences. So, for example, your equipment. Okay, um, so I want to I want to book a campsite in September. And um, I wanted to point out to you the tabs at the top of this page. So I'm on uh, the first tab, which is camping, which is what I want. If I wanted to book a cabin or a yurt, I would go to the roof tab. Um, we also have vacation houses. We have marina slips to reserve. We have group camps and we have day use facilities, which are picnic shelters and, and other day use facilities. Um, and then the retreat centers, a uh, tab is used for availability. All the retreat center reservations are made at quarters. So um, I want to stay on September 28th. Uh, I have just one night. My equipment is an RV, um, a small RV. Um, I did uh, enter in here my party size. So um, that's really helpful for state parks to make sure um, you have your correct party size in there so we can count it on our attendance reports. And then in terms of the park pose, I'm actually just gonna leave this at Washington State Parks so I can see availability throughout the state. Um, now what I could also do, do here is I could use filters. So if I wanted an ADA only site, I could select that here. I could also select um, utilities. Uh, but I can also see that on the map and I wanted to show you that. So I'm, I'm gonna leave the filters um, as they are for now. And I'm just gonna hit search here. And um, so what, what happens here then is I, I'm, I'm getting a map of the state of Washington and um, I can now look at availability across the state. So um, I have four quadrants of the state here. Uh, the green dot means there's something available in that area. Um, I can look at this on a list as well, but I'm going to use the map. And I'm just going to click into Southwest Washington State Parks, and then I can see all the state parks that are located in that area. And some of them have green dots, some of them have gold, some of them have red. So any park with a green dot has um, availability for my search criteria. And the ones that don't, um, they either they don't basically. They they um, Possibly they don't have RV sites, they don't, they're not open during that time period, um, or maybe they don't have camping. So um, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna uh, select Miller Sylvania. And um, then once I do that, I can see um, I can see different camp loops on the map that I can reserve in. So I've got three for camping here. Um, and two of them here have pictures of little tents. And if you hover over them, you'll see this is unserviced camping. So there's no utilities. Um, so if I do want a utility site, I'm gonna look at this loop here, which has a picture of the little RV and um, has service camping. I'll see the other, these other two loops here, which are for um, resources in the other tabs. So this is a vacation house. And this is for group camp and kitchen shelters. Um, notice, notice some other information on the maps, so roads and things like that. So if you're concerned about being close to, to a road, uh, you know, take a look at the map and see where the site is located. So 
So here's my service camping loop. And I've actually driven through the park already and I, I know the site that I want. Um, I also wanted to point out that if you are looking for an ADA site, that, that those are, um, that we do have a graphic for that on the site. So you can use the filter or you can also just look for that icon um, on the map. Um, so I'm just gonna select uh, site 238 here. And um, notice I, I selected that on the map. Um, I can also look at a list of sites on this list view over here. And I can also look at a calendar view, which would show me a list of sites and the dates that are available. So let's just go back to the map here and um, click on 238. And you'll see over there on the right is uh, information about the site. So we can see um, there's a maximum of two vehicles per site. We can see the equipment um, that I selected is allowed on the site. Um, it does have an electrical water hookup, uh, 30 amp electrical services. If I click on view more details here, I could I have a little bit more information about this as well. So for example, I can see that this particular campsite has a fire pit, which most of them do. Um, so there's a site photo. So depending on the site, these utility sites are, are pretty straightforward, but um, some sites uh, in some parks might have uh, multiple photos for you. Uh, also a couple other tabs up here. So if you wanted to look at information on the park, um, there's a link to our state parks web page here. And then um, the dates tab just shows the, the dates that these, the campsites are reservable and also that they're open operating. Another thing you can do here, let's say I really wanted to stay on a weekend and you know I, I picked a weekday here. If I um, hit available dates for this site, I think this will come up here in a moment here. It's being a little strange. Let's try again. There we go. Okay. But then I can look in, on the calendar and see when, when this site is available. Um, so the first weekend in September is September 18th. Um, looks like the August is pretty busy. I have the date and the site I want, so I'm just going to hit reserve and I'll just take you through the rest of the reservation process and then we can move on. So um, this page is just to make sure that you uh, review your reservation details, make sure everything's accurate, right date, right site, right park. Um, these uh, messages here are from the park, so they want you to know you can only have two vehicles in a, in a campsite. Um, one vehicle is included with your campsite fee. If you have a second one, then, then you, pay, um, you pay for an extra fee. So I'm just gonna acknowledge these messages. Um, there's a transaction fee to book online. Uh, they're not refundable. They do pay for the reservation website um, and, and um, the, whole, the whole reservation system. And um, so I'm gonna acknowledge that. I'm gonna acknowledge the reservation details are correct and that I've read messages from the park. And those messages there will be specific uh, to the park. So uh, take a quick look at those. Okay, so, so once I get to uh, the checkout, um, the site will be held for me for about 15 minutes. So if I walk away from the computer, it, it will expire in about 15 minutes. Uh, but I also, before, before I hold that, I, can, I have an opportunity to add another reservation. I could book up to three in one session um, on the website. I could also purchase a gift card. Well, we're actually going to pay for this with a gift card. And then, um, then I, can, I can take a look at policies if I want to. There's links here. So um, park policy, so the rules of the park, if you're interested in learning about um, you know, policies with pets, that type of thing, that, that would be in that link. And then um, if you need to, if you think you'll need to change or cancel your reservation, um, take a look at the change in cancellation policy so, so you know what's involved in that. I'm just gonna confirm that I've taken a look at that. I have my account details here. So this was all stored in my profile. And if I realize I'd moved, um, I, could, I could edit it. At this point, um, I could reserve for other people. Um, so, um, you know, as I mentioned, I can reserve up to three campsites. So, if you're reserving uh, for a group for a date, um, you can reserve for yourself and and your friends. Um, and 
Um, at this point, I'm just going to reserve for myself, so I'll just confirm that here. Um, here's where I would enter information about a discount pass if I had one, but I'm going to use the full rate and pay for it in full. And uh, then I have I can add on some additional purchases. So that extra vehicle we talked about that. Um, if you're going to be bringing a second vehicle to the campsite, you can pay for that in advance and uh, that'll save you some time and check in. You won't have to, um, you won't have to spend that time um, at, at the checking in, providing that information about the extra vehicle and making that payment. You can do that in advance. Um, you can also buy an annual Discover Pass on the website. Uh, so you do not need a dis Discover Pass if you're camping, but if you're visiting the, the parks during the day, um, you do. And if you do purchase this online, take a look at the information here. Um, you're not going to get it instantly. It'll be mailed to you and you'll get it in 10 days. So, so make sure you, you just take a quick look at that information. But I'm going to skip this and I'm going to go ahead and pay for my reservation. Um, I happen to have a gift card. We just launched gift cards. Uh, so I'm just going to pull that up and apply that. Um, so I had purchased this gift card as an electronic gift card, and I have it registered to my account so, so I can use it for, um, for my reservation. So I'll just apply the payment there, and I'm all set now. So that's how to make a reservation. Uh, and um, you know, again, some, some tips for finding availability. Uh, use that statewide map. It'll, it'll give you some more options, help you take a look at uh, which parks have availability. Um, drive through the campground um, ahead of time, uh, if you can, so you can see what the sites look like. Uh, look at the site information. That'll give you all the information on the site, utilities, um, the, the dimensions of the site, um, that type of thing. Um, you can also look at available dates. So if, if your site is booked for the dates that you want. You can take a look at when it is available. Um, reserve early or anytime at least a month in advance. And, and then also consider off season and weekdays. So now you can also call to make a reservation if uh, instead of doing it online at 1 888 campout. And um, thank you. And um, now I can take any questions. Laura, we have the questions in your chat. Okay. Do retreat centers need to be booked through this website? Um, no, um, what you would do is call the retreat center program. You can see, um, you can see if a retreat center is actually, I believe it, if it's gold, if it's available, um, because they're not actually booked on the website, but they're booked, they're red. If they're available, they're gold. And um, you can call Diana McDonald at uh, headquarters and she can help you book that. What happens if we arrive late to the park? Well, your, your booking is guaranteed through 1 p.m. the next day. So, um, and, and I don't know if you're asking about getting into the park. Usually um, if the gates close, there, there is a way to, to open it up. Um, and uh, so, so it, it's fine if you arrive late to the park. Um, I heard the state parks now has gift cards that can be used for reserving campsites. How does that work? Well, you can purchase an electronic card on the reservation website. Um, once you purchase it, you can purchase it for yourself or for someone else um, and, and you can send it to them. Um, you'll receive an email that you can use to activate the card and then uh, you can register it to your account. Now you can also purchase, if you want a plastic gift card, you can purchase those at State Parks Headquarters in Tumwater at the front desk. And um, they can also be registered to your account. Um, are pets allowed um, in cabins and other roofed accommodations? Um, we have specific uh, resources available uh, for pets. So if you're, you're booking a cabin, uh, you'll wanna look at the site description to see if um, it is a pet friendly can cabin. And um, I believe the filters also allow you to narrow down uh, to just the pet friendly resources.
Okay, great. Hey everybody, we're back at Miller Sylvania now. Uh, thanks so much, Laurel, for that great explanation. Another thing that some people don't know is that there is actually some camping on WDFW managed lands as well. Uh, some of the, the there, there are campgrounds, they're a little bit more limited. Uh, two locations that you can look for is the Columbia Basin Wildlife Area in Grant County or the Mount St. Helens Wildlife Area in Cowlitz County. And then there's also dispersed camping on most WDFW managed lands and even some at water access sites um, unless otherwise posted. So that's some good information to have. Just a quick reminder that if you have questions, please just pop those in the Q&A or if you're watching with us on Facebook, go ahead and just put in your comment and we'll get to those here in a little bit. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Matt Lincolnship with WDFW. Hi everyone, Matt Blankenship with WDFW. I'm a wildlife conflict biologist. And here today I wanna to talk a little bit about uh, keeping a clean camp and preventing conflicts with wildlife. So one thing we need to remember is when we're out recreating either at our state parks or at our wildlife areas um, that we're sharing this habitat with the wildlife that is around us. And we need to do our part to, in order to prevent the conflicts that may arise if we're not doing um, proper things in order to keep our camps clean. So one of those things that we want to do is food storage. Food storage is an important piece about preventing conflicts with wildlife. When we often talk about food storage, um, people often conjure up images of bears, but food storage is also important for other animals like raccoons and mice and crows and other critters that might be trying to get into your campsite or where your food may be stored at. So when we are storing food, it's important that we don't want to try to feed some of these wildlife because if they do get into our food at our campsites, they can become reliant on our food at our campsites and reliant on people. So when that does happen, unfortunately, they can become reliant and they can be coming into our campsites more often, which might lead to close encounters. It might least lead to um, damage to our camping equipment of them trying to get into our foods. Um, it might also lead um, to them potentially acting aggressively um, in a rare circumstances. So what we want to try to do is, is store our food in a, in a proper manner to help protect the wildlife and to protect ourselves when we're out recreating in some of these areas. Um, a couple of things about food storage that is important to know, be that you're recreating at our wildlife areas, at our state parks, or even our national parks in Washington state, it's important to know that some places have varying regulations. So know before you go, um, when you do go, do the research, uh, make sure you are um, able to know uh, how you, they're regulating you store your food in certain manners. Um, every place is a little bit different, but Today, uh, I wanna provide you with a couple different uh, pieces of advice on what you can do to store your food in any situation when you're out camping, be that primitive camping or at one of our state parks here. So um, a couple of things we wanna do is number one rule, never if you're camping in a tent, store your food in your tent. We don't ever wanna do that. That would just lead animals to wanna to come investigate. And unfortunately you might get a mouse in your sleeping bag. Definitely don't want that. So the next thing we wanna talk about a little bit is, um, is if we are storing our food and we're able to drive a vehicle or if we're taking a travel, travel trailer with us, um, we wanna store our food inside of our vehicles, be that the trunk of our car, the cab, um, the back of a pickup, if you have a hard uh, cover for the back of it, um, those are all good places to store your food um, or your garbage. Um, when we are storing food, please remember that we also are storing things that may have the odor of food. That's your cooking utensils, um, even cooking equipment in some cases. So. Um, what I also want to talk about is storing food in our coolers. If you are camping in bear country, you really want to try to get a hard-sided molded cooler um, that will store some of the odor and that is also lockable. Some of these have tabs on them that you can lock um, to prevent any animals from getting inside there. They are also um, certified by the interagency grizzly bear committee. Um, you can look at some of their products online that they certify. These products are tested to prevent bears or um, any other types of wildlife from getting into them and uh, getting into your food while you're out camping. If you are able to store your cooler into your vehicle, if you're in an area where you can, please try to do so. Otherwise, if it's not in use, have it locked up so nothing can get inside there. Another thing you might want to consider is using bear canisters. Um, these are not just for bears. They're also going to be used for other pieces of wildlife as well. Raccoons, um, things like that won't be able to get in. These are hard-sided plastic. They've been tested and they work really well preventing bears from getting in there. So you're going to want to put things in here that have any um, food odors or anything like that. 
um, that you can use. Needless to say, there's a lot of products out there that can help you out while you're out camping to prevent some of that stuff. What we want to try to do here is we want to minimize our odors at our camp um, as much as possible and our food odors at our camps. So if we can, um, try to minimize that as much as possible. You're going to want to try to pick up any food scraps that are out, wrappers. Just make sure you want to keep a clean camp out here so there's no scraps for any of our little critters that are out here to come and feed on. So another thing I wanted to talk about as well is when you're doing your dishes at your campsites, um, try to strain some of those, um, those food particles that are in there that might have come off of your dishes when you were doing that and dispose of those with your garbage as well um, and make sure those are secured in your vehicles in the evenings. So remember, respect the wildlife that is here, um, respect the space and the habitats that's around there. We're sharing that with them. Keep a clean, clean camp as much as possible. Store your food properly. And remember to have a good time at some of our Washington State Parks, wildlife areas and national parks in our state. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna send this now to Ranger Schlossler and, and uh, he'll be able to talk a little bit more. Thanks a lot. Hey everybody, I'm Park Ranger Lance Slosher. I work here at Miller Spain State Park. I also work at Tolman State Park, Rainbow Falls State Park, and the Wilton Hills Trail. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about fire campfire safety in state parks. So we do have a few things that we, we do um, want you to do for obviously safety reasons. Um, whenever you come camping at a state park here in Washington, all your campsites are gonna have these, these fire rings in them. And obviously that's there for you to have a campfire. So if you're going to have a campfire in the state park, have it in that fire ring. Don't find a cool little spot out in the woods somewhere and make your own little fire ring. Um, obviously, we don't want any of that to lead to wildfires or any kind of damage to the resources in the park. So also, when you're having your, your campfires, please try not to bring stuff like pallets or any kind of wood that may have metal debris in them, um, because obviously, um, we don't want a little kid to be walking through the campsite and, and end up with a, a nail or a staple in their foot from something like that. Also keep everything in the fire ring. If, if your, your firewood's outside the fire ring, that could end up leading to fire exiting the fire ring and spreading to um, nearby grass or bushes or something that could be flammable and, and possibly light on fire and, and start, start a wildfire. Also, um, Check before you come to any state park for any burn bans. Obviously this time of year, especially here on the west side, there's not gonna be very many burn bans going on, but just check before you come, just to be sure. Especially on the east side, burn bans are gonna come to effect a little bit sooner than they are here, here on the west side of the state. Um, but as most of you are aware, you know, starting in August, just definitely need to start checking for burn bans on the west side of the state. That's why we start to get a little drier and we start to see some of those wildfires um, spark up. So just do that. Uh, the website for that, is going to be parks.state.wa.us slash campfires. So make sure you check that website before you come. And, and again, find your campfire ring, make sure your fire's in it, and you can have a fire in there, but nowhere else, please. Um, also, we want to talk about being a courteous neighbor. So obviously, when everyone comes to state parks, you guys want to have a great time, right? We want you to have a good time. But some people have a little different idea of what a good time is. So some people may be a little rowdier, um, they have kids and kids can be a little bit loud and people next to you may just want to be relaxing and being quiet, go to bed early. So keep in mind that during the day, you're allowed to be a little, little noisy, but you still got to be respectful of your neighbors and you can't be interrupting their peace and quiet, right? Also state parks do have quiet hours. So our quiet hours start at 10 a.m. And after 10, or um, excuse me, 10 p.m. So after 10 p.m., you got to turn the radios off. You got to get the kids to settle down. Pretty much all noise needs to be contained to your campsite. So the campsite beyond you, they shouldn't be hearing you. Um, if a park ranger is walking down the, the campground road, they shouldn't really hear you You're doing anything more than just softly talking as they're walking by. And um, just, just try and be generally respectful of your neighbors. Also, quiet hours end at 6 a.m. That's pretty early, right? But still try and maintain that respect for your neighbors. You may still be sleeping in on their weekends and everything. So um, also throughout the day, you know, there's no quiet hours throughout the day, but we do ask that you, that you try and be respectful. You know, some of some music, you're playing music during the day that may not be something that your neighbors appreciate, especially if it's, if it's got offensive language in it, try and do your best just to limit that type of stuff. Um, also generators, if you bring a generator to like your basic campsite, that, that needs to go off at 9 p.m. Um, and again, that's just going to be something that's going to help start, start quieting everybody down and start helping them get ready for the evening. All right, 
So again, just be respectful, be courteous, and enjoy your stay with us when you come camping. Any questions, Sam? Yeah, we do have one question. Uh, why is it important to bring local firewood or put, purchase firewood from the park? So that's important because some areas may have some kind of like parasitic insects and some insects that, that are invasive that could spread to the lo locality you bring it to. So say there's certain like beetles or something that may be invasive to an area that you're from. Well, if you go to the opposite side of the state where those insects may not already be inhabiting the area, you've now introduced an invasive species that's, that's just gonna spread even faster in that area. So that's why when you come to the park, we ask that you purchase firewood in the park. Oh well, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Ranger Schlosser, for that information. Just another quick reminder, you guys are sending some questions to the Q&A, uh, please continue to do so. And please continue to ask questions on Facebook. Both Matt and Alyssa are gonna address some of those that have been coming through as well. And I'll go ahead and turn it over to Nikki Fields with Washington State Parks. Hi everyone, I am Nikki Fields and I am the ADA coordinator or Americans with Disabilities Act coordinator for Washington State Parks. And I am here today to talk to you about how to find opportunities for, um, for recreation opportunities for people with disabilities in state parks. And I'm going to show you our website. So let me share this. So this is the Washington State Parks website. The link was already posted earlier when uh, Laurel shared it to talk about reservations. So there are um, three places where you can get to the map I'm going to show you, and I'll show you how to find each of those. Um, so hopefully you'll remember one of them. One place to find it is under this find a park link at the top. <clears throat> under find a park, you'll see ADA recreation map. So that's what we're gonna be talking about today. But you can also find that link in a couple other places. One is that, um, under programs, there's also the link to ADA recreation at the top. That'll go to the same place. Or if you were looking at a particular state parks page, there is information in here on uh, what amenities are accessible for people with disabilities. And then there's this link to the ADA rec recreation map. So once you've clicked one of those links, it'll take you to this page, which has some, um, some information on some of the accessible facilities that State Parks has, and then it has this interactive map. You can use it within this page, but what I recommend doing, or what I'm gonna do today, is to go to this link that says link to full size map. And that makes it so that you're just looking at the map and you don't have all of the other information on there. It's a little easier to scroll when, when you just have the map. So right now you're seeing a map that has little trees for all of the Washington State Parks. And if you were to click on any of them, so I'm gonna click on this one, that's Lake Wenatchee State Park. It'll give you a little information about the park and it'll tell you here that it has accessible campsites and an accessible restroom at Lake Wenatchee. If you want to find out more information on Lake Wenatchee State Park, you click this link here and it would take you to the Lake Wenatchee Park page. Another way that you can um, look for accessible facilities is to search for what you're looking to do. So over here is um, select ADA features. It looks like a magnifying glass. If you click on that, you'll see a list of different kinds of recreation opportunities that are in parks. So cabins, campsites, dock, fishing piers, there are uh, trails, playgrounds, vacation houses. So you can select one of these and I'm going to select cabins and I'll see where we have places where we have cabins that are accessible for people with disabilities. And it looks like we have several parks here, each of these. And so there we have cabins at Wallace Falls and Bayview, Cama Beach, Dosey Wallops, 
Bell Fair, Twin Harbors, and Dash Point. And so um, if, if you want more information on any of those, you can then look and see if I wanted to go to Dash Point, I could use those cabins. We also have accessible uh, campsites there and restrooms, and I could learn more about it by following this link. If I wanted to look for a place that has not just cabins, but I want cabins and a trail, I could select more than one feature at a time. And when I do that, it's only going to give me results that have both cabins and a trail, not one or the other. So when I look now, there are two parks that it's showing me. And this one is Belfair State Park, has accessible cabins and an accessible trail. And you also see that it's got an accessible picnic area as well in the park. Um, so you can use this search function to, um, to select whatever kinds of facilities you're interested in. There are, um, there are some interesting ones like petroglyphs. If you click on petroglyphs, you'll see that we have one park that has petroglyphs and you can access them if um, accessibly for people with disabilities and that's at Columbia Hill State Park. This map works like um, a lot of the maps that you use online in that you can zoom in and out and so you can see uh, different parts of the state. So I'm zooming into Penrose Point here and um, and see what is there. Um, I can zoom out and if I'm looking for a place that um, that is in a particular part of the state, I could use this zoom or, or pan function. So um, this is this is our ADA recreation webpage, and I really hope that you're able to use it to find some fun things to do while you're out camping or or looking for wildlife in the parks. I would also like to share with you a couple of recommendations for places where you can see some wildlife. I'm going to give you some, um, some recommendations that Alyssa didn't talk about earlier. These are places that are in more urban areas of the state. And so these are places where you might be able to go that are close to home and still see some wildlife. And so the first one I'm going to talk about is Lake Sammamish State Park. Lake Sammamish State Park is in King County. And, um, and it's right at the southern tip of Lake Sammamish. Here's the information there. Um, for ADA features, we have a playground, a restroom, and a trail there. If you go to Lake Sammamish, um, I'm gonna have to make this smaller so I can get to my other tabs. If you go to Lake Sammamish, we've got a wonderful accessible boardwalk that goes out to the mouth of Issaquah Creek. And if you were to take this boardwalk, you could um, get views along the creek and possibly see some salmon there. There are also a lot of other trails at Lake Sammamish that are pretty flat and um, they're not as, as firm and solid as this boardwalk is, but a, a lot of people with disabilities might be able to use them. Um, if you can, if you can navigate on trails that are uh, bare earth or that are grass, but that are are flat, then you might be able to get out onto these trails. And um, there is a heronry at Lake Sammamish, so if you get out into the wetlands at at the park, you might be able to see some great blue herons flying ar around the trees and um, near the near the water at Lake Sammamish. So that's really exciting. So another park I'm gonna to talk to you about is Saltwater State Park. And Saltwater is in Des Moines and also in King County um, and a little further south. And it's right on Puget Sound. And Saltwater, you see here, it's got an accessible uh, campsite, restroom and trail. The things, the places where you can see wildlife at saltwater is two, two places. One is that there's a creek that runs through the park 
It's called McSorley Creek and it's a really good place. You can get up close to it and you can see the salmon that are spawning in the fall. So it's, it's a good place to see salmon. There's a, a several places in the park where you can get very close to the creek um, in your wheelchair or um, very easily on a relatively flat paved surface. And so that's a good place to go see salmon. And then also if you are a, a scuba diver and you're able to navigate a few stairs to, and swim a ways um, to get out in the water, we do have an, a, a really cool artificial reef at Lake Sammamish, and, I mean at Saltwater, excuse me. And um, in, if you go to that artificial reef, you'll be able to see some cool things like this. Uh, these are some photos that were shared by the friends of, of Saltwater State Park. And, um, and there are some, some really cool critters that are living down there and in the artificial reef. And these are things that you don't get to see in many state parks. Also, uh, staying on the shoreline, you might get to see some guys like this, this elephant seal that visited saltwater recently. So um, those are just a couple of recommendations that you don't have to go very far away from home to be able to, to see some wildlife within the state. And um, let me look and see if, if we have any questions. Oh, so somebody said that there is a telescope there so you can watch the marine life at saltwater. So that's really great. Um, I'm open to any questions or um, otherwise I'll, I'll turn it back to Sam to, um, to talk about some more things, but I, I hope you get out into the parks and, and enjoy those accessible facilities. Thank you so much. Hey everybody, we're back at Miller Sylvania. Thanks so much, Nikki, for that great explanation. I did just wanna mention that uh, some WDFW managed boat launches have some ADA accessibility as well. And you can look those up at wdfw.wa.gov and then look at the boat access areas and type in ADA and you can see what those facilities look like. So we're gonna turn it back over now to Alyssa to talk more about some wildlife in state parks. Hi there. Thanks again for staying with us this evening. It's, it's about 6.48, we're thrilled you're still here with us. I wanna address some loose ends. I didn't get to you in the first program I did before I dive into the next bit here. The first one is of course to thank Department of Fish and Wildlife for hosting this event and welcoming Washington State Park to join them. So I'm thrilled and honored to have that, just like Ranger Matt here. Well, Ranger Shaw here, <laughs> sorry for that. Um, next, uh, I earlier mentioned that you could check out the native lands that you are living on or recreating on. Uh, that website is nativelands.ca. So I encourage you to check that out. Go online to make that happen to see where you're at. Um, thirdly, I mentioned that incredible wolverine sighting uh, down south at Cape Disappointment State Park, which by the way, is not a disappointment. I encourage you to go there. She has her own Facebook page, Wanda the Wanderer. So make sure to check that out. That was made by one of our parks employees and it's definitely worth looking into. And I wanna mention lastly, um, all these beautiful state parks we're talking about, there is a Discover Pass required to recreate. We do have free days and there's several that happen uh, monthly in fact. So the next time you're in the area, you can align your trips and your wildlife sighting opportunities on days that they are free to come and visit. So I encourage you to do so. Um, I'm gonna go right into some of the more urban wildlife watching opportunities. Thank you, Nikki, for bringing up any of those parks that offer both ADA accessibility, as well as opportunities to see those critters. Because in the first half, I mentioned a lot of animals that are maybe rare sightings, seasonally sighted or migratory species, but that's not the only animals we have here. We have a lot of resident animals we see year round. So let's go ahead and talk about some of those. I want a bit closer to you here. So first off, a lot of the animals we have in Washington can cohabitate with one another and they actually have habitat preferences that are met across the entire state. So let's show you again really quick. There are many different eco regions across Washington which offer that biodiversity I hinted about earlier. And the thing I have to mention is once again that rain shadow that divides our state in half. But beyond the, the south, north, east, west, all that variability, we actually have climates within. So such as the Okanagan Highlands, the Columbia Basin, down here in the Willapa Hills, and up in the Olympic Peninsula, the North Cascades, the South Cascades, there are so many different regions that offer different habitat opportunities. And you're gonna find animals, depending on their needs, living within those areas. It kind of makes sense that way. However, 
there is a gamut of critters that live all across this entire state because they don't have very specific needs. They can live in a variety of different areas. Let's go into that. These are animals you've probably seen before or heard of while you're visiting our state parks. Especially if you're by the water, this is one you're gonna be familiar with. Beaver. Yeah, this one's a bit like a Mr. Pancake here. They're not normally this flat. I tell you that much. They normally have guts inside. But this beaver pelt showing you right there, really thick fur, an over layer of fur, and then the under layer of fur. This species is adapted to live in all different climates throughout Washington State. So beavers are an animal you're going to find in whatever region you are camping in. Um, these tend to stick to their own business, but they do follow water. So if you're by water, you might see those. Besides beavers, there's other animals as well. Thank goodness we don't have smell of vision. Otherwise, this might not suit your fancy this evening. This is the Western striped skunk. We have these across our state as well. There are places you kind of send, tend to see them more often, more in the Eastern region, kind of the arid climate, the sagebrush shrub step. However, they're here too in this park as well. And a, a cute fact, a group of them is called a snuggle, a snuggle of skunks, but I don't encourage you to snuggle with them, believe me. What's next? Well, we got lots of animals. Back to the water critters. This beautiful sleek weasel right here, the river otter. Again, if you're by water, there's a very good chance an otter is not too far away. These ones are actually very social and gregarious. They have been discovered simply playing for enjoyment. Um, so as you're playing and having a good time, you might see one of these as well. Are you having fun still? I sure hope so. Let's learn a couple more animals in the area. I think we learned a bit about this one. Uh, it's scientific name is trash panda, right? That's what they call it, I'm pretty sure. We learned about how to keep a clean camp and how to keep this animal where it belongs out in the wild. But here you are firsthand, a beautiful glimpse at this uh, raccoon. And this is a critter again, that has really been able to adapt to all different regions within Washington. And is found in almost every single one of our state parks. They tend to really enjoy water, a lot like the beaver and the river otter. So if you don't see the animal firsthand, there's oftentimes evidence of that animal. Can you think of animal evidence that a raccoon might leave behind? Hmm. That S-C-A-T word, yes, scat, they leave that behind. There's also traps within the riparian zone, that rich bit of habitat between the water and the forest. Raccoons make themselves at home just about anywhere, including our campgrounds. And one more pelt I'd like to showcase today, and I gotta remind you firsthand, all these animals you're meeting are what we call ambassadors for their species. They're here to teach you about their wild counterparts. You don't often get to experience animals firsthand like this, which is why we're bringing it to you live this evening. One more animal you're probably pretty familiar with. You probably have seen them in your park and you might even have a relative of this animal living in your home. And I'm talking about the coyote. So we have a lot of coyotes across the state. A lot of people have mixed feelings about these critters, but we're gonna talk about the habitat needs and they can be found almost everywhere across our state. They're gonna be right in the middle there with the omnivore category. So they help to maintain and balance wildlife populations. So we've seen the pelts firsthand. Look at that fur. Let's move on quickly to some of those critters and look at their skulls because that in itself is very exciting as well. Now this one in particular, people get really excited about, but people get a little nervous about too. And I think we learned a bit about that earlier today. The black bear. Let's take a look at that black bear skull. Now this is a common size for a black bear. They're not as big as people realize. They're actually pretty small. But again, remember to give them their space and respect the wildlife in our area. So black bears, believe it or not, are omnivores. A lot of us humans identify as omnivores as well. I wanna quickly show you the teeth. Just as a reminder that we don't have that we actually have a lot in common and not that far different from one another. You've got your incisor teeth, just like us. Those canine teeth, though mine are smaller, and those big flat molars to chomp down on their food. The difference between us, we like to cook our food and they prefer el dante or in sushi form. Well, I'm just about to wrap it up for the evening, but we should end on another critter that people, just like the black bear, get very excited about. If it's not a dog, there's the feline family, isn't there? I have a feline representative for you this evening. This right here. We have bobcats in Washington. We have lynx way up north along the Canadian border, but the most common one around here that's big 
charismatic megafauna, it'd be this apex predator, B, what do you call it? Mountain lion or a puma, depends on what you'd like to call it. But this mountain lion, this cougar, look at the difference between the bear teeth. Those are all very sharp and tended to rip and chew and uh, basically dispose of. There we are. We're gonna wrap up our evening with a final farewell from our friend the black bear. A little wave from our friend the black bear right there. And uh, I gotta end on a final, final, final note. If you see this in the woods, don't assume it's, uh, I don't know, Bigfoot or a human. If you see this in the woods, it might just be a black bear. And we're gonna learn what to do when that happens. Alrighty then, I'm gonna say farewell for this evening, put my mask back on, and thank all of you for joining us here at Miller-Savania State Park. And the next time you're in our park, keep your eyes out, use your senses to explore the world around you, and you might just come across an amazing animal friend. Goodbye. Hold on a second, Alyssa. We have some oh. questions for you. All right. <laughs> Just um, so what is considered shoulder season at state parks? That's a great question. I, uh, I had to look this one up, to be honest with you, because in the, in the campgrounds, it's always busy it's for us. It's busy most of the time. So our shoulder season is basically April through May, and then again, September through October. So we have the off season, which is the middle of winter. We have the summer season. You're all familiar with that. Then we have these delicate little shoulder seasons where things are a little bit different, but I should mention animals are here all the time. Um, okay, great. What is the best park to see wildlife at? Hmm, that's a really hard question. I'm a little biased because there's parks I've worked at that are near and dear to my heart. But as far as wildlife sightings, I mean, if you wanna see a banana slug or a Douglas squirrel or a garter snake, almost all of our parks are gonna have something like that available to see. If you want a really unique sighting, I mean, some people love old growth forests, some people love the coastline. That's a really tough question. I will tell you though, and I hope my boss doesn't get mad at me for saying this, but my favorite park is Rockport State Park up in the North Cascades. Bald eagles, elk, bobcat, coyote, it's a very special place to be. That front country borders the back country and that's where the magic happens, I think. Awesome. Um, how do I join a park's interpretive program? <gasps> that's a great question. I'll tell you right now, uh, in, in the realm of COVID, things have been a little bit strange. Um, we have a lot of virtual learning opportunities online. If you go to parks.wh.gov website, which is our parks webpage, we have an entire section devoted to educational opportunities. But we have what's also on YouTube called hashtag RangerTube. You can find me on the RangerTube. You can find all the rest of our interpreters on the RangerTube. And those are great opportunities to join online from the comfort of your own uh, bedroom living room, bathroom, I suppose, but it's coming into the summer season. So we're gonna start offering programs in person as well. Go onto our parks webpage again, there are calendars listed and those events will be on there as well. And then if you ever really unsure and you're planning your trip, don't hesitate to call our state parks or email us directly. And someone like me or the rangers around here will answer all your questions for you. Okay. And then I'm new to the state. Is there a good place for a birding trip for a weekend camp trip? That's a really great question. Again, the birders is a unique opportunity, and I know there's so many avid birders in our state, and I'm so glad that you're here um, enjoying this program and asking those kinds of questions. The first thing that comes to mind is there's a lot of birds that are both migratory or residential, and it depends on what you want to find. If you're trying to seek that snowy owl passing through, there's going to be a certain place on a certain day at a certain time you got to go to. I encourage you again, I'm going to reference what I said originally, the Great Washington Birding Trail. There is Audubon maps that you can follow and kind of check off that list where to go. Almost all of our parks, well, of course, all of our parks have birds at them. But there's a certain species you're going through and you're wanting to find. We have lists online that you can kind of catalog and check off. Um, otherwise, go to Audubon, check out where the sightings are, or again, call a park staff member. But by water, lots of wetland species, and the forest, lots of those that depend on that habitat. Hard to answer. All right, I think that's it. The mask officially goes on. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. Matt Blankenship again. I appreciate you guys having me and staying with us. Uh, thank you, Alyssa. That was great. Um, and a lot of really good information and some really cool props that she brought with us. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, wildlife viewing best practices when we're out here at our state parks or our wildlife areas, or even some of our national parks. Seeing wildlife in the wild is an amazing experience that a lot of people will never forget. 
it's, it's one of those that um, we hold dear to us. And so we need to still remember that we want to respect the wildlife and remember that we're sharing the habitat with them. So a couple of things that we can do when we are viewing wildlife. One thing we want to remember is keep our distance. Don't try to approach them. Um, we want to maintain some space from them. Let them be in their wildlife habitat. If you do want to get a really good close look at them, grab a pair of really nice binoculars or a spotting scope. Um, they really make some really cool stuff. You can attach to them and take pictures with your cell phone cameras um, that are really good. So you can get that kind of close experience with them. Um, that's, that's a really good tool that we can have. Um, what we don't also want to do is try to feed them to lure closer. Um, as I stated before in my, in my previous segment is that we don't want to feed wildlife that hasn't become uh, reliant on us because there's a lot of really bad things that can happen. One is that sometimes the food that we have is not necessarily good for the wildlife. Um, another thing is, is that they can sometimes act aggressively. When you also try to approach them and feed them, they can act aggressively in defense of themselves. Um, so we don't want that to happen. Um, another thing that we want to try to do um, when we are viewing wildlife is be courteous of others that are around us that are viewing wildlife. We don't want to harass them or try to approach them. Remember that others might be out here in the field with us looking for wildlife and looking at some of these birds that are in some of our areas. And we want to respect that as much as possible. So be courteous to your neighbors. That's another thing we want to remember. Now, I also wanted to talk a little bit about um, preventing conflicts with wildlife when we're on the trail. Um, if you're out or are out hiking, remember, it's always a good idea to carry bear spray with you if you can. Um, bear spray is not just for bears. It's also for elk and moose and cougars and any other wildlife that might be out on the field. Um, they're out on the trail with you when you're out there. So remember that. Try to carry bear spray with you um, when you're out on the trail. Uh, make your presence known when you know, talk to a friend, hiking groups, um, you know, carry a bear bell with you as well. They just make some noise for you when you're on the trail. A lot of times our interactions with wildlife when we're hiking occur when we startle something. So we definitely don't want to do that. So if you make your presence known, the chances of reducing those conflicts go down drastically. So um, that's another thing we want to do. In the event that something does happen and you're on the trail and you get close to an animal and you encounter it, there's a couple main rules that you need to remember. One, you need to try to stay calm. Try to stay calm as, as much as possible. Make yourself big, make your presence known. You can yell, you can make noise. Put out your arms, make yourself as big as you can. If you have a jacket, open your jacket up so you look bigger to it. Um, never turn your back on an animal if, if you encounter one. Always back away slowly as much as you can. Don't ever turn your back. And then um, in the event that that doesn't work and, and by a rare circumstance that an attack does occur, um, you just want to remember to fight back as best as you can. Use your bear spray. Know how to use it. Practice with it. Um, those are some things that we could remember. Um, I appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for um, you know joining us and staying with us. Uh, we've had a lot of really good uh, presenters today, and I'll answer any questions that folks have. I think I had a couple, so I'll check with Sam if I have any. Yeah, you do. Okay, so how can people protect food from raccoons when they're hiking in? Oh, good question. So um, I don't know if I touched on that in my previous one. If you wanted to uh, protect the food while you're hiking in, um, a couple places regularly, and I think I remember showing you guys this earlier, but a couple places would make you um, actually pack in some of these uh, bear canisters with you. These are really good for raccoons. If you don't have access to this um, and you're unavailable to get to it, there are a lot of other options as far as food bags are concerned. Um, most of these bags, I'll come up a little bit closer so people can see. Some of these bags are really good. These are really made out of a chain mail um, or Kevlar material that animals can't scratch into or bite into and get at your food. Now, I can't say that your food won't be crushed from this because uh, it likely will if an animal does get to it, but it will be safe and they won't be able to get into your food there. So these are really great options for when we're hiking in um, or carrying food in with us into the backcountry or even hiking camps in some of these wildlife areas. So that's a good option for you. Great, another question that you kind of touched on, but we'll just ask it again. What should I do if I see a bear or cougar while camping? While you're camping, you wanna make your presence known. Remember, if it's there, you wanna make lots of noise, try to scare it out of the way. Um, if you're at one of our campgrounds, um, you wanna definitely talk to one of the rangers as, as soon as possible, report your sighting, um, let them know that it's there um, and just make your presence known. Try to scare it away as best as you can. In the event that it doesn't wanna leave, we want to try to move from the area as soon as you can, slowly, um, as not to startle it away from the area. And then definitely let a ranger know that an animal's at camp. Great. What is your favorite wildlife area to hike in? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I'm kind of biased. Uh, I really like um, 
I really like the Chief Joseph wildlife area out on the east side, um, especially the, the 4.0 ranch unit of it. Um, that's one of my favorite places in the Blue Mountains. Awesome. Just got another question in. Should I filter water or is it safe to drink out of mountain creeks? I would say always filter your water because um, you never know what's upstream from there. So it's always a good practice to filter your water as best you can, unless you know that is a, um, um, you know, yeah, we just actually just worry about filtering your water. I think it's your best bet. Yeah. And then could you just talk a little more about having your bear spray available while you're hiking? Yeah. Yeah. So a few folks, a lot of times will buy their bear spray. Um, they come with nice holsters sometimes, but a lot of folks will put them in their packs um, where they're not accessible. The main thing that you want, because oftentimes when these interactions with wildlife occur, they happen suddenly. Um, so you need to prepare yourself for that. And having it available for you and not fumbling with it can help protect you and help protect the wildlife as well. Great. We got another question. I'm not sure that you know the answer to it, but I'll ask okay. it anyway. How often are people actually hurt by wildlife? It's a very rare occurrence. I think uh, you know the statistics, especially like for a cougar, for example, the statistics I think is you're about seven times more likely to get struck by lightning than attacked by a cougar. It's a very rare occurrence. Um, I think you're more more likely to get hurt uh, driving your car every day when you're going to work. So those are some things to keep in mind. And if we do our best to make sure we're storing our food and we're making our presence known out in the field and we're respecting the wildlife that's out there, the chances of those things go down even further. So you can still enjoy the wildlife that's out there and enjoy recreating in some of them. Thank you. I appreciate it. Have a great day. Well, that's the end of our program, everyone. I just want to thank everybody again for tuning in for the end of the evening. Thank you so much to Washington State Parks for joining us. I keep forgetting to take my mask off. Thank you so much for Washington State Parks for joining us this evening and putting on this great program. And thanks to Matt for giving us some great wildlife tips. Just a reminder that we did record this, so it'll be on our YouTube channel um, later this week. In addition to that, some of the links that we mentioned and some of the other videos that we talked about will be on our Medium blog, and you'll be able to find that blog from the WDFW homepage, which is wdfw.wa.gov. Thanks again, everybody. Have a wonderful evening, and we'll talk to you soon.